to Access Rhode Island. My name is Kate Brewster and I'm the Executive Director of the Economic Progress Institute and host of this week's program. As the state's economy continues its slow recovery, unemployment and stagnant wages are leaving many Rhode Islanders unable to meet their basic needs, including food. My guests this week are Representative Maria Semini, who not only represents District 7 in Providence, but is also the SNAP Outreach Coordinator with the Feinstein Center for a Hunger-Free America at the University of Rhode Island. Welcome, Maria. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Kate. I'm also joined by Lisa Roth Blackman, the Chief Philanthropy Officer at the Rhode Island Community Food Bank and the Chair Board, uh, Board of our Chair at the Economic Progress Institute. Welcome, Lisa, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, so we're taping this program a few days before Thanksgiving, uh, which is a time when everyone is concerned about hunger and wants to make sure that families are able to enjoy a Thanksgiving meal, but we know that hunger um, is a problem that exists throughout the year. So Lisa, can you just begin by talking a little bit about what the Rhode Island Community Food Bank does and how you serve um, Rhode Islanders through the local organizations? Sure. So we are sort of the central distribution warehouse for a network of agencies that are members of the food bank. Um, and they are actually distributing the food directly out to people in the community. So we have about 178 agencies, mostly food pantries, some soup kitchens and meal sites, and some shelters. And they are really the front line. They're in just about every city and town around the state. And um, through that network, we're serving 68,000 people every month. And that usually spikes a little bit in November around this time. So it may go up. Wow, people working overtime, I know, at Thanksgiving. Um, you just released the Food Bank's Status of Hunger Report, which you do every year. Uh, there was a great and um, powerful story today in the Providence Journal. Uh, so what does the report tell us about hunger in Rhode Island? So sadly, it tells us that hunger over the last five years has increased. So we now have 15.4% of households in Rhode Island are what the USDA calls food insecure. It means they may not have enough money to make it to the end of the month. They may not have enough money for food in the household. So that's about 66,500 households across the state that are, are suffering um, with low wages, low income. And really one of the big themes that we've noticed, especially um, as the economy sort of continues to sputter a little bit, is many of those people are have someone working in the household and um, either full-time or part-time, but at not a high enough wage to actually cover the basic needs of the family. So um, there is a, a wage story here in a lot of ways in terms of how people are able to make ends meet. And of course, really because you provide such great service, um, when people have to use their income for rent, where there isn't a lot of help um, and other basic needs, and they know they can rely on the food bank. Um, and I just wanted to point out, you mentioned that 68, you serve 68,000 people every month, which is like almost double from five years ago. Is right, that? so it is almost double five years ago, and um, you know we've really seen that go up in line with the recession. You know, it started to spike when the economy crashed back in 2008, and it, we were, we're leveling off, but it's still sort of high or ticking up rather than starting to go down. Even though we're seeing signs of life in other parts of the economy, the stock market is booming at least this week. And um, but people at the bottom who are being served at food pantries when they run out of money towards the end of the month really haven't seen a recovery in the way that maybe some other folks have. Right, it's really um, incredible numbers. Maria, um, the Feinstein Center runs the SNAP outreach program. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about the services that your team provides uh, through the University of Rhode Island? Sure, so before I talk a little bit about what we do, just for the audience to know, SNAP is the new name of the food stamp program. So many people are familiar with what the food stamp program was. Right. About four years ago, the federal government changed the name to SNAP, or the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Uh, and at the University of Rhode Island, we have a contract with the Rhode Island Department of Human Services to help people to access SNAP benefits. Um, and that's to both enroll people or to help people to enroll in benefits who are eligible uh, and not receiving, to help people to maintain their benefits, um, and also to just do general public education around the program. Uh, we find that a lot of people are unfamiliar with how the program works and what the guidelines are. Uh, and that's true from the average person sitting at home today to the person who may be in a pantry line who's, mm -hmm. who really could benefit from accessing the program directly. So we do a variety of things. We have a media campaign, so uh, positive messaging that we air on radio stations and bus ads Sesame and so Street. forth. Sesame Street. <laughs> uh, right. The Lawrence Welk Show. Um, <laughs> 
We do a lot of material creation to explain facts about the program, mm -hmm. facts about how to, how to be eligible for the program. And then we also have a team of what we call direct outreach workers. And these are folks who are trained to know about SNAP and we send them out into the community. They're in the community seven days a week, morning, noon, and night, often mm -hmm. at, at network agencies of the Rhode Island Community Food Bank, but also at health centers and at senior centers. Mm -hmm. and. WIC clinics and high rises and homeless shelters and uh, community fairs where we can just share information about SNAP. And in doing that, we hope to demystify the program, mm -hmm. to debunk some of the myths of the program, uh, show people who aren't familiar with the guidelines a little bit more about um, how the folks who are eligible for SNAP are really in need. Mm -hmm. There's a misconception that it's a very easy benefit mm -hmm. to access, and actually it's it's a very arduous process, and mm -hmm. that's because the federal government, which oversees the program, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, has very high standards for program integrity, mm -hmm. and those are enforced in Rhode Island at the Rhode Island Department of Human Services. And so while, um, while that's important and the integrity of the program is important, it can also be confusing. So what I think is our biggest goal or one of the biggest things that we do in our office is to talk to people who may be eligible, help them to understand the process they're going to go through when they get to the Department of Human Services mm -hmm. so that when they get there, it's a smooth process. Mm -hmm. And they go knowing whether or not it's likely they're going to be eligible. They go knowing what to expect in terms of the application process and the interview. What to bring. What to bring. <laughs> <laughs> and then it makes it uh, a smoother process on their side, but it's also helpful to the staff of the Department of Human Services who are, quite frankly, overworked. Mm -hmm. um, as Lisa was saying, and you mentioned that the food bank has seen quite an increase in participation or need over the last five years, as has SNAP. Mm -hmm. And there's been some critique of that nationally more so than locally. Um, there are right now about 101,000 households uh, utilizing SNAP benefits, but that's really a direct relationship to our poor economy. Right. Um, for many years, uh, as the SNAP outreach project or at SNAP advisory meetings, we would see graphs that would map participation in what was then food stamps and the unemployment rate. Right. And as unemployment went up, food stamp participation always went up. Yeah. And that's what the program should do, right. to respond to need in the community, and that's exactly what it's been doing. Well, you guys have been doing a great job. I mean, clearly the economy is driving those numbers, mm -hmm. but it, you've done an amazing job of informing people, as you said, who may have no idea. Um, they're right. struggling to pay their rent and childcare and keep up with other expenses, and they can provide a tremendous amount of relief to get even a reg, you know, relatively small benefit mm -hmm. of SNAP, um, SNAP benefits. So that's terrific. Thank you. So, Lisa, um, unfortunately, Congress is debating some deep cuts to SNAP, some really deep cuts. Um, and at the beginning of this month, um, everyone who's enrolled in SNAP lost um, some portion of their benefits because some of the boost that was provided during the stimulus um, expired. What's going to be the impact, um, and will the food bank be able to respond to that growing, what will be even um, growing need among these households? Right. So this is something we're really worried about. I mean, the, the network of food pantries that are serving people out in the community, in most cases, or in many cases, are filling in after people's SNAP benefits mm -hmm. are running out. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it goes hand in hand, and the, the food, emergency food network is really an emergency food network, although it's become much more of a monthly sort of necessity for people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that is there when they, they run out of money to spend in the grocery store, they have nowhere to turn, they're going to the food pantry and getting resources. So now, already there's been a cut, I believe it's about $36 a month for a family of four. Mm -hmm. It doesn't sound like a lot, it adds up, I think it's 400 some odd dollars for a year. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a lot of pasta and sauce or mm -hmm. other things that a family could buy to stretch their budget. Mm -hmm. um, and in aggregate, it adds up to, over the course of a year, it's $20 million that is coming out of the state of Rhode Island that would have been spent in grocery stores right. and corner stores and other places. Right. That's more, much more than the entire budget of the food banks. So there's no way that we can mm -hmm. just make up for it. And I think around the country, you would hear, you know, the charitable food network uh, could never make up for the kind of cuts that happened now or certainly the kind of much bigger cuts that we're talking about. All we can do is sort of do the best we can mm -hmm. to do the same amount or a little bit more and give everybody a little bit less so that everybody gets something is what will happen because people at the food pantries, and you know many of these volunteers, they're loath to turn anyone away. Mm -hmm. So it just means they have to make the bags a little bit smaller mm -hmm. if that's what happens so that everybody gets something and nobody goes away empty-handed. Right, and part of the report 
report that was released today shows that the donations to the food bank are actually down. Um, and there are some reasons, good reasons for that. And, um, but it's certainly making your job harder. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. So this is a, also a nationwide trend, and it's a really a sort of challenging set of trends to have the need going up over the last five years. At the same time, um, we've seen a pretty large decrease in donated food from the supermarket and the manufacturing grocery industry. Not because they're not generous. I always have to say we are right. not throwing them under the bus. Right. They're doing lots of other things in the stores. They're making grants to food banks. But they're much more efficient than they used to be. So they just don't have the excess food to donate. Right. And again, this is a nationwide trend. Mm -hmm. It's not just Rhode Island. Um, so we've seen a decrease over the last five years of about 2 million pounds out of 10 million that we now distribute in a year. So it's 20%. And um, yeah. so that, obviously, at the same time that we see the need going up and now SNAP benefits being cut is a pretty challenging situation. Um, we've set some goals about trying to um, increase our funding and our fundraising. Um, what we do to make up for that in some ways is we're purchasing more food at wholesale, which you know, 10 or 15 years ago, you never would have seen food being purchased at that scale at food banks. Mm -hmm. um, the good news about food purchasing is we collaborate with other food banks in the region. We're driving the price as low as possible, and we're buying really good, healthy food that families can use to make a meal. So, you know, pasta and sauce and cereal and canned soups and beans and all the things that you would want a family to find in their cupboard as opposed to sort of snacks or sugary beverages or other things that we might be able to get in donation. We're trying to minimize those items and we're only purchasing really good food that people can use to make a meal. So some good news, but the need is tremendous. And certainly at the end of the program, we'll tell folks how they can donate um, to both of your organizations, which is critical. Right. Um, so Maria, people might be watching and want to know, maybe I'm eligible mm -hmm. for SNAP benefits. Um, can you just give us a sense of what some of the guidelines are and give people a sense of whether they might want to call your team to come sure. out and meet with them? Sure. Um, if you don't mind, before I, I get into that, I just wanted to comment on something that Lisa oh, said please. about um, about the recent SNAP cuts. Mm -hmm. uh, and I read uh, around the time the SNAP cuts were going through on November 1st that what was cut nationally, and it was every SNAP recipient across the right. nation lost benefits, was about $5 billion, wow. which is the same, uh, approximately the same amount of money that the entire charitable network that does hunger assistance or hunger relief throughout the nation spends. I've seen so that statistic the as well. $5 yeah. billion dollars that the entire charitable network spends mm -hmm. on providing food assistance to low income people, to people in need is a, the same amount of money that was cut from SNAP benefits. Mm -hmm. And so already the charitable network was struggling to keep up with the need and the increased need with uh, the poor economy. Mm -hmm. And and I think I just want to make that clear because it was really startling to me to see that those two numbers were equatable. And when people think that the charitable network can just step up and do some more, um, and yeah. it's certainly run by tremendous people, uh, both staff and volunteers who do the best that they can, there's there's a limit, right. and we need to be aware of that. And just to mention, Lisa mm -hmm. brought this up, I mean, it's $5 billion taken out of state economies, and we know that there's a multiplier effect, and right. when grocery stores have more purchases, they're able to hire more people, I mean, it goes on and on. So right. this is going to have an impact just on state economies, um, in addition to, obviously, people's ability to feed their families. Absolutely. Right. That's true. But if there are people watching today who are themselves looking in their cupboards and not sure how they're going to make dinner or they know that they have a, an elderly parent or a next door neighbor with a young child, um, the majority of eligibility for SNAP is based on income guidelines. Mm -hmm. um, most of the time, if you meet income guidelines, that's what makes you eligible for SNAP benefits. So for a family of three, if their gross income is less than about $3,000 a month, I think it's $3,016 mm -hmm. a month, that gets them through the first step of SNAP eligibility. Mm -hmm. There are actually two steps uh, within those income guidelines. You need to meet the gross income test, and then the Department of Human Services takes certain specific deductions from your income based on your expenses to see if you meet the second income test. Mm -hmm. So that gets a little confusing pretty fast. Yep. So, and this is really where I think our office can be incredibly helpful because we know that there's that gross income test that unless you're elderly or disabled, you need to meet. Mm -hmm. So a three person household needs to have a monthly income that's less than about $3,000 a month. Mm -hmm. It's about $36,000 a year. Yes, yep. yes. <laughs> if you do have an income below $3,000 a month um, and you're wondering what your next step is, then getting in touch with my office is a really good thing to do. So we have a toll free number that I'm going to say right now. Please. It's one eight six six. 
1-866-306-0270. Again, that's 1-866-306-0270. And that's a, a, a toll-free information line. And if your income is around that guideline, and you call us, one of our workers will ask you some questions about whether or not you pay for childcare or mm -hmm. adult day programs, uh, whether or not you have medical expenses or what your rent or mortgage is. And we'll do the math to help you figure out whether or not you're likely to meet the second step. Mm -hmm. Because the math is a mystery that mm -hmm. no one could figure out by mm -hmm. themselves. <laughs> right. And so we can answer those it's a black questions. black box of it, <laughs> stamp eligibility. It really is. Um, now, I should be clear that no one from my office can determine mm -hmm. eligibility. In fact, no one outside of the Department of Human Services in Rhode Island can determine SNAP eligibility for mm -hmm. a Rhode Islander. But what we can do is to tell you whether or not, based on your inf the information you share, it's likely you may be eligible. Mm -hmm. uh, whether or not, with the estimates you share with us, we, say, we may say, you know, this is kind of close. Maybe you want to pull your medical bills mm -hmm. <laughs> before you actually go to DHS mm -hmm. so that they have as clear a picture as possible. Mm -hmm. We can mail out an application or direct you to where you can get one online, talk you through the process of whether that everyone needs to have an interview with mm -hmm. DHS, but it can be done in person or over the phone, or you can have someone else do that interview for you. Mm -hmm talk to you about the documents you may need, and then uh, hopefully you go to, to the Department of Human Services prepared to go through the process smoothly. And people, once they apply, have about, there's about 30 days bef when within that time frame they're supposed to find out whether they're eligible? Yes, for the majority of people, um, DHS has a 30-day window mm -hmm. to make a determination on eligibility. For some folks, it's a shorter time frame. Um, but most people, when they apply, they look at, within 30 days, they know whether or not they'll be eligible. Mm -hmm. If they are, they'll get a card. Mm -hmm. Benefits now come on a card. It's called an EBT card. Right. So if you see signs that say, we accept EBT, and you don't know what it means, right. <laughs> that's what that is. Um, and then benefits are deposited on that card the first of the month, every month of the year. Mm -hmm. um, and I would like to just also add that if your income stays low, you can stay on SNAP for a long period of time, really, until you no longer need the benefit. Mm -hmm. But that's with regular communication with the right. Department of Human Services. You don't share information once and then they give right. you food for the rest of your life. Right. There's Is it every six months or a year? Every six, about every six months mm -hmm. you have to fill out paperwork and, and document your income. Mm -hmm. Again, and nationally, the average SNAP recipient actually receives benefits for less than a year. Mm -hmm. I think it's around nine months. Mm -hmm. So while it is a program that's available long term, most people use it as an emergency right. or to get them through Falling on hard uh, times. a problem that they're having financially. I just want to say, mention for one second um, while we're on eligibility that mm -hmm. many adults um, now who have are low income, who do not have children, are newly eligible for Medicaid mm. uh, through the expansion under the Affordable Care Act. So if people are watching and they think, well, I may be eligible for SNAP, if they have income that is below around $16,000 a year, um, and they're, again, don't have children, they may now be eligible and should apply um, for health insurance through the exchange, which is healthsourceri.gov. Mm -hmm. oh, gosh, I should know that. Um, but definitely, people should be looking into that as well as SNAP. Mm -hmm. um, and people will be able to enroll and be covered beginning on January 1st. So that's really important. There's 44,000 people who are estimated to be living in Rhode Island to be newly eligible mm -hmm. for um, this form of health coverage. So very important. So, um, Lisa, the, the report today did suggest some steps, some action steps that um, the state of Rhode Island can take, that Rhode Island residents can take to uh, improve food security. W could you talk about what some of those are? Absolutely. Yeah, we always publish a set of recommendations when we put this report out. Um, so one thing is to encourage our congressional delegation to fight back against the cuts that are being talked about in Congress. Um, for SNAP. Uh, the good news is that they're really mostly on our team, so you can't call and harangue them right. because they're They're, <laughs> they're always on for, our side. They're on yeah. our side. They're <laughs> fighting for truth and justice and right. to the extent that they can influence others in D.C. Right. who are their colleagues. That's right. Um, so that's one thing. Um, we're also advocating that the state increase um, the food bank's legislative grant back to our 2008 level, um, which was $350,000. We're at about half that now. Um, and we are... Um, just to compare, there's a few other states that we compare to oh, in the report, and we are shocking. just about um, the lowest state investment per capita um, compared to some other nearby states. Massachusetts um, has a much larger investment. Um, in New I, York, I wrote New this Jersey. down. Can yeah. I say what it is? Go ahead. Um, I'm sure you remember, but I was shocked. So state investments through the grant 
per capita, so if you divide it by the population, in Rhode Island is 16 cents compared to Massachusetts, which is $1.67. So it really is it's a big difference. It, yeah. Um, and that, you know, those funds would go a long way. We can acquire um, through paying the freight on donated food as well as purchasing food at wholesale, um, we can acquire about three pounds of food for every dollar donated. Wow. So if they bring us back up to the 350, it's a million pounds of food that we can bring into wow. the food bank and distribute. That goes a long way towards making up some of the cuts that we've right. seen and some of the loss in donations. And it's all for food acquisition, right? All for food. Not for administration. It's not paying salaries. That all goes towards right. either purchasing food or paying the freight on donated food or sending our trucks to pick up donated food. Mm -hmm. um, but it's all to bring food into the, into the building. Um, so some of the other recommendations, um, we are talking about um, improving um, the use of the school breakfast program mm -hmm. in lower income communities. And we have seen some good improvement in this area, um, where in the last few years it's gone from about 20,000 kids receiving breakfast in the classroom during the school day to about 30,000. But if we can continue to improve upon that, um, there are a lot of low income kids that will benefit from that and that will take some pressure off of those families. Um, and the other area that we're doing a lot of work is um, on summer food service program. Mm -hmm. So a lot of kids, about 50, 51,000 kids are getting free or reduced price lunches during the school year and a much smaller percentage of them are getting um, those meals during the summer. So right. if people don't think about summer as a time of hunger and challenge right. for families, there's no heating bills, it's not the holiday season, but the reality is that those families are losing um, five meals a week, the lunch that the kids were getting, and in some cases the breakfast if they were right. getting breakfast. So we've been doing a lot of work with um, the city and the Department of Education to try to sort of add more summer feeding programs. They do them in conjunction with recreation programs or with summer camps um, that are serving kids with lower incomes and trying to get more kids meals during the summer when they're out of school. Excellent. There are other nutrition programs that we haven't really talked mm -hmm. about, which includes the ones you talked about, WIC, um, which is a nutrition program for pregnant women and their babies when they're born up to age five. Um, so there are some other important um, tools out there that people can access. I also just wanted to mention a fifth recommendation, which I have to bring up because you're the director of the food bank and I have talked about it often, yes. which is increasing the state's um, the refund that people can get through the state earned income tax credit. Mm -hmm. So Right, and again, that puts more money in people's pocket, um, which enables them to either pay their bills or buy more food or whatever it is. Right. Um, and one other point that I want to make just on the state investment um, is that we talked about the rate of food insecurity or the rate of hunger is 15 and percent and change. Um, that is the highest rate in New England. So yep. we sort of have one of the lowest investments, but the highest rate of food insecurity in New England. So it's a challenge. Yes, it is. God. Um, Maria, you've been a champion for low-income Rhode Islanders as um, in your capacity as a state representative for the past four, three, three years. years. <laughs> um, can you give us a preview of some of your priorities for the coming year? I'm sure getting the food bank's uh, legislative grant back to its um, <laughs> right. Please, or, original <laughs> um, 2008 level, would I'm sure. Um, sure you'll be supportive of. But do, are there other priorities that you have set for the coming year? Well, uh, Absolutely. I mean, I think that, that one of the goals of, of my goals as a legislator, and I think one of the purposes of government is to make sure that people have access to, to services, to have uh, an equitable playing field for folks. And things like access to some to school breakfast and school lunch play into that, access to, to food play into that. And I was actually um, really pleased to be able to, to be a sponsor of the legislation to up the, the food bank's grant last year. So I'll be looking to that uh, to do that again. I didn't again. even know that, but I'm, of course I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, That's great. And and the the increase of the refundable EITC is certainly very important. Mm -hmm. um, I think that one of the things that we struggle with in Rhode Island uh, clearly is that we have an economy that's struggling. And what I frequently hear and read is that we have a skills gap and that mm -hmm. the, that good paying jobs that would allow people to support themselves without these types of uh, other government services are just difficult to come by mm -hmm. um, because, not because they're not there, but oftentimes because the people who need them don't have the skills to, to be successful mm -hmm. in those places. So I think that really working on um, workforce development mm -hmm. is a very important thing for us to be doing as a state to support our communities, not just to support families, but also to support business and to support our greater society. Um, by it gives people the opportunity to to uh, earn a living, to 
go to work every day, to contribute to the greater community, to contribute to our tax base. Right. <laughs> All good things. Right. Um, and additionally, as we do that, though, I think we need to be mindful of the fact that when people haven't been working for some period of time, they may need some extra supports in mm -hmm. order to get to that place. Mm -hmm. So for a few years now, I've introduced legislation to allow for um, individuals who work at least part-time who are also pursuing an education or training program to be eligible for a child care uh, mm -hmm. support during the times that they're at school. Right. So right now, if I were a mom who was working part-time and also going to CCRI in the evening or maybe in a CNA program, um, I don't have access to child care subsidies during the hours that I'm in school, right. which means that I may make a financial decision to not pursue additional education because mm -hmm. I can't afford to put my mm -hmm. children in a, in a reputable daycare right. or uh, child care center. I may make a decision to, to leave my child with a neighbor or with a slightly older sibling mm -hmm. who maybe isn't equipped to, to care for that child. Mm -hmm. um, and I suffer from that, my family suffers for that, and really the greater community suffers for that because right. if I'm not gaining those skills, I'm not putting myself on a path to being able to get a better job in the future. So those things are very important to me to both make sure that we're um, creating programs that fill the skills gap, computer programming, CNAs, things like that, but also supporting people as they go through those programs. Absolutely, and I think what you hear coming more and more and more from the business community is they can't find the skilled mm -hmm. workers that they need. That just came out of the Small Business Summit, the, mm -hmm. the training and education were critically important, and if we're going to ask people to do that, and we've got more than 80,000 adults in our state who do not have a high school diploma. It's a large number. It's far more of a share of our workforce than Massachusetts um, or Connecticut mm -hmm. has in terms of lower skilled workers. So we've got to make the commitment to provide those supports so that if they want to go to an apprenticeship program or wh whatever the training may be, ESOL, adult basic education, that they're able to do that um, mm -hmm. and have their children in the same early learning or childcare setting that they've been in while they're at work. So yeah. um, incredibly important. So we've got a couple more minutes. Um, I want to give you both a chance to uh, say how people who are watching uh, can support your organization, support your cause. Um, Lisa, you mentioned the um, One Kid Can uh, campaign. Do you want to just talk a little bit about that? Sure. So we put this uh, guide together in September. September is Hunger Action Month, and we get asked all the time, you know, how can I volunteer? And I want to get my kids involved, or mm -hmm. we want to do something as a family. And um, we can't have kids volunteering at the food bank. It's a warehouse. It's not safe. There are age limits and all that. So we came up with this really great guide with ideas for kids of all different ages, of things that they can do in their community, in their school, with their religious community, club, or organization. It's downloadable Excellent. on our website. What is your website? Um, We've got our, 30 seconds left. We'll get both websites in. All right, rifoodbank.org. And I'm sure you can make a donation through your website. You can. Absolutely. Excellent. And, and Maria? With our website, we have eatbettertoday.com, and that's a place to learn all about SNAP and to access services that we can provide. Excellent. And I know there's a ton of information on both of your mm -hmm. sites about how to apply. Yours has all of the member agencies, lots of other opportunities uh, for people to, to help through donations, through programs like this. Um, you have some networks like the Women Ending Hunger, where people come together to talk about strategies um, that they can engage in to help, um, to help reduce food insecurity in our state. So I really I want to thank you both so much for being here. It's an incredibly busy time, I know, with the holidays coming, people wanting to do more. Um, and I just I want to thank you for taking the time uh, this evening to come out. So thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.